Yeah, great. Uh, we're very happy to see that so many people have decided to attend this talk, uh, and I hope that it will be interesting. Uh, my name is Christian. Uh, I am a software developer at Bouvet, where I work together with Martin. Um, there I worked on a variety of different projects. I have been hired as an export to a court case. I have tested positioning technologies for the subway here in Oslo. Uh, but lately I've been busy working on Android using Kotlin. Hi, my name is Martin. For the past 10 years, most of my project has been writing enterprise software for banks, insurance companies, and oil companies. That is, of course, lots of fun and interesting. But sometimes we get some of these small, exciting projects that really makes a difference. For instance, doing a security review of internet-connected toys. First, a little about the agenda for this talk. <coughs> we will start out by explaining the background for the project, go on to show you how we did the actual testing, go on to reveal some of our findings, and finish by showing you what happened when we published our results. The customer for this project was the Norwegian Consumer Council. It is a consumer protection organization who works to increase consu consumer influence in society and to contribute to, to consumer-friendly developments. So, why would the Norwegian Consumer Council be interested in internet-connected toys? More and more consumer products are connected to the internet. And while there are strict regulations when it comes to physical aspects of a toy, um, like fire safety, toxicity, small parts, choking hazards, and stuff like that, there is a lot less focus on information security and privacy in the same toys. These devices are often produced by companies that not necessarily have a lot of experience in the field of information security, and their main focus is often to ship as fast as possible rather than to make it secure. We have had many recent incidents, including when someone launched a huge denial of service attack against Twitter and PayPal, and it turned out that the source of the attack was a bunch of hacked web cameras. Another concern is that it is often surprisingly hard to fix security flaws in connected hardware once it has been sold to the end customer. In some cases, the manufacturers have simply forgotten to add firmware update capabilities to the product, which uh, result in that you have to throw it away if, you, if there is uh, a security flaw discovered after it has been sold. We have also noticed that there is very limited interest from manufacturers to write security updates for old products that are no longer in sale and they're not making money on, even though people are still using them. And even if manufacturers provide security updates for a product, many cons consumers are reluctant to update. And while most people have eventually learned that you should update your computer regularly to keep it safe from viruses and exploits, very few do the same to their laundry machine and to the toothbrush. Before we go on, we must explain a bit of, uh, about the scope of this project. It was a small project with a limited budget. Therefore, we could not test everything, and we had to limit the test to a small selection of devices. The devices we did choose for this project was the top sellers in Norway at the start of the project. <clears throat> okay, so here they are. This is IQ and this is Kyla. Uh, we have uh, uh, Kyla with her. Uh, we have Kyla with her uh, here us today. Uh, they are functionally almost the same, uh, and their biggest difference is how they look and their personalities. And if you can't tell by the pictures which one is marketed for the boys and which one is marketed for the girls, uh, I can tell you that uh, while IQ prefers to make jokes and farts. Uh, Kyla prefers to talk about cooking and uh, helping her mother with her daily chores. <laughs> so, yeah, in other words, the gender stereotypes from the 60s are, uh, well, they're still here. <laughs> These dolls are manufactured by a company called uh, Genesis Toys, and they claim that IQ and Kyla are the world's best talking dolls. So, uh, both IQ and Kyla represent what the industry are calling smart toys. Uh, they utilize modern processing power, algorithms, and the cloud 
to enable powerful new features, such as playing games, having conversations, remembering your name, or maybe even your favorite color. Furthermore, they can answer almost any questions, including simple math questions. This includes stuff like, what is a potato? What is two plus two? Or maybe who will die in the next season of Game of Thrones? To answer these questions, they search the internet for answers. More specifically, IQ and Kailas uses Wikipedia, Google, and a weather service called Weather Underground. Then a simple uh, text-to-speech function reads back the answers. So how do IQ and Kyla work on a hardware level? Because even though IQ and Kyla are smart toys, there isn't really anything smart about them. However, your smartphone is smart. The toys are actually just a speaker, a microphone, and maybe most importantly, a Bluetooth chip, which enables them to communicate with your phone. Your phone, of course, has access to the whole internet by Wi-Fi or 4G. Uh, so in essence, all the logic is handled by an application on a phone, which you can download on either the uh, App Store or Play Store, and the dolls are basically dressed up Bluetooth headsets. So, let the testing begin. We started out by examining the communication between the iPhone or Android apps and the internet. Earlier projects had shown that uh, many apps send huge amounts of data, including personal information, to third parties like advertising, advertisement networks. So the consumer console was very interested in if this was the case for these dolls as well. We also wanted to check what information was sent and if the information that was sent was properly encrypted. The easiest way to examine the traffic between a mobile app and the internet is usually to use Wireshark or a web, de web de debugging proxy such as Fiddler. For the initial test, we chose to use Fiddler because it is easy to set up and use. It has great protocol and format support for things like a HTTP, JSON, XML, and so on. And that helps a lot when examining the data. The ability to manipulate requests and responses is also very nice when testing the service side APIs and the client on how they respond to unexpected data. Another great feature is that it actually does HTTPS decryption, which allows us to peek uh, into the data, zipping back and forth, even if they are encrypted. HTTPS encryption is usually very hard to break, but since we control the client, there is a simple way around the encryption. We generate a fake root certificate, which we install on the client, and then redirects all traffic through our monitoring computer. This is known as a man in the middle attack, or in our case, man in the middle attack. We don't break the encryption, we just tell the phone to encrypt using a known key. Much of our motivation for doing this presentation is to, start to get you to start paying an attention to how much data your apps and devices are collecting about you. And since Fiddler is very easy to get started with, we thought we could just as well show you how to use it. It has a very simple installer, and all of you will get through that without problems. But to, to, collect, to monitor uh, another device, you have to enable that. Just open the options and allow remote computers to connect. You also have to make a note of the port feeder is listening on. And to decrypt the HTTPS traffic, you have to um, enable that, and you also have to export a root certificate and send it to the device you want to monitor. To install this root certificate is very simple on devices such as the iPhone or uh, Android device. You could just email it, open the certificate, and install it. And you should also rem remember, if you get an email like this, then you should be very careful <laughs> about what you are installing. You also have to set up a proxy server and use your Fiddler machine as the proxy server. The easiest way to do this is in the Wi-Fi settings, but you can also do it so that uh, it constantly sends through the proxy if you want to see what information is sent when you are on the mobile network. Because of client isolation, it is often simpler to install Fiddler in Azure rather than to run it on your local computer. The only thing you have to remember if you use Azure for this is to open a port for Fiddler so that you can talk to it. 
Now, when it's all set up, we can run Pidger. As you can see, there will be lots of data coming in. And much of the data you will see the first time you start Fiddler like this is not from the app you're trying to monitor. So make sure that you close down uh, all the apps you're not uh, planning to monitor. And if there is some system services, you should close the them as well. But even if you do that, there will probably be some chatty stuff from the operating system. So you must probably use some filters to get rid of, rid of that. Um, when you are when you have filtered out what you're, you don't want to look, um, each line in, um, in Fiddler represent, uh, represents one web request. And I've marked one of them for closer inspection. This is the raw view. And uh, if you have really good eyesight, you could probably see that, that there is a header here, and there is a body, and there is something that looks like JSON. Luckily, Fiddler understands re uh, JSON and can give you a much clearer view. A closer look reveals that it sends the device ID to a third par party. This allows for tracking across uh, multiple applications, and this is typically the things we are looking for. We are looking for device IDs, usernames, passwords, email addresses, GPS coordinates, and stuff like that and generally things that are being sent to places it should not be sent to. However, Fiddler is not bulletproof. There are several ways for the app to detect or block the monitoring. This is an, uh, an attempt at SSL, SSL pinning that we found in one of, one of the apps we were testing. It's uh, kind of crude because it only checks the name of the certificate and checks that uh, it contains some string. So this is, of course, uh, uh, very simple to get around. But it does show that uh, you cannot rely on Fiddler alone when doing tests like this. Because if someone is doing something nasty and they, want, they are really trying to hide their tracks, then it will be more work to find it. We, we will explain more about the decompiling of apps uh, in a few minutes. Okay, so in addition to Fiddler, we also use the tool called Wireshark, uh, which is known as a packet analyzer. And uh, Fiddler has powerful uh, functionality, such as being a proxy server and the, the ability to decrypt data. Um, Wireshark does not have those features. Uh, as we know now, uh, Fiddler is able to pick up HTTP messages, which exist in the application layer. Uh, however, uh, Wireshark goes deeper in the network stack. It can read that from the transport layer, like TCP or UDP. It can read from the network layer, like IP datagrams. It can even read link layer protocols, such as the Ethernet. Uh, so Wireshark is basically able to see everything that's going on in the network. And as long as you're able to somehow funnel the traffic through your computer running Wireshark, you should be able to see that traffic. So. Uh, in the user agreement of the dolls, the user has to agree that the recordings made while playing can be used freely by the company that made these dolls. Because of this, the Consumer Council wanted us to see uh, if we could find uh, if play sessions were indeed being uploaded. Uh, furthermore, if records were being uploaded, it was of interest to see where the data was being sent and also how it was sent, like was it encrypted or not. And uh, Willer cannot find these kind of data streams, so we have to use Wireshark for this task. We will soon show you a demo of Wireshark uh, using a previously recorded session with Kyla on iOS. But, we, but before we do, we would like to tell you about some of the difficulties of using Wireshark. Because the biggest strength of Wireshark is arguably also its greatness weakness. It picks up messages from all over the network stack, including, including messages from uh, low-level network protocols such as the address resolution protocol. And because of this, it is especially important to try to filter out data which is not relevant to you. And as in the case when using, when using Fiddler, the operating system uh, and other background uh, programs might pollute the network traffic. In our experience, the best way to deal with this is simply to use multiple recordings and look for patterns between different sessions. A second method that helps a lot is to use a strict testing protocol. This is helpful for uh, multiple reasons. 
It makes it easier to identify interesting data as you have an idea when to expect that it will show up. Uh, it makes it simpler to compare sessions and look for patterns. And lastly, it becomes easier to reproduce and evaluate re results later on in case that would be necessary. So this is the testing protocol which we used when testing. Uh, and as you can see, uh, after five seconds of starting the recording, we started the application. And at around 15 seconds, we played, we pressed the play button in that application. At, at, at around 20 seconds, we asked the doll a uh, general question. Then at about 60, 60 seconds, we asked about the weather. And this process was repeated three times for each doll and operating system. So let's go into the demo of one of those recorded sessions. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, this is data recorded using the iOS, iOS app uh, and Kyla. So, oh, oops. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, let's see. So we know it. So we No, we don't have to do that. Okay. Okay, so this is how Wireshark looks like. And as we can see, there's a lot of things going on here. And it can be a bit like disencouraging to look at all this data. Uh, the first column here is the time column, which shows when a packet arrived. The ne next is the source and destination column, which shows either the IP or MAC address of the uh, message. Then there is the protocol. Then there is the length of the message, uh, shown in bytes. This includes headers. And then there is some other general information which Wireshark might think uh, you find useful. So at the top here, we find a um, message from the ARP protocol, the address resolution protocol, which we is obviously not interested in. So what we can do is we can press this uh, filter, and we can write not ARP. It's very simple. And then we have removed all of the ARP messages. Uh, and then at the top, there is an SSDP protocol, which is, oh, well. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should zoom in a bit so that yeah, well, we can uh, zoom in. see. Is everyone, yeah, OK. Uh, Where is the plus button? There. Let's see it. OK. No, that no. didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Minus. Yeah, OK, we're not going to do that then. OK, then we'll explain. Yeah. Uh, the next protocol which you see at the top is the message from an SSDP protocol. That this is a plug and play protocol made by Microsoft to enable plug and play functionalities for like devices like printers and such over the network. And we're not very interested in that either. So to filter it out, we simply write and not SSDP. Very easy. So uh, and we could continue going through the protocols, but it's not very efficient. Because what we're really looking for here is the data going either to our phone, to our phone, or either from our phone. So what we can do is write uh, uh, and IP address equals 192.168.1.74, which is the IP address of our phone. And now we're only seeing data that is either going to our phone or from our phone, which is very useful, of course. There is, however, a lot of these acknowledgment messages from like TCP and sync messages, which doesn't really contain any useful data for us. And the easiest way to filter those out is simply to write and not TCP length less than one. This simply means that there has to be at least one byte of data in the message. Otherwise, we're not interested in it. This does not filter away TCP retransmissions, though. And we can also filter those away. We can write and not TCP and null, oh, sorry, analysis dot retransmissions. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and those should be gone. Uh, there isn't any particular field in the header of the TCP messages which tell Wireshark that this is a retransmission, retransmission message, but Wireshark is clever enough to figure it out for us. So. At this point, we have filtered out about 75% of the data, and it's starting to look a lot cleaner. Um, so another cool feature of Wireshark is that we can color code conversations. We can just press a packet, and we can press Control-1, 
and it will try to color code all the packets that belong together. Um, and if we do that with the first message, we can see that this is a message, a DNS query, which goes to gstatic.com. Uh, and then we see a couple of messages which goes to that IP address. And this is very easy to see because if you go into the DNS query, we can open it in a new window. Oh, sorry. And we can go into the domain name system response. And we can check the IP address. And you can see that gstatic has the IP address 172.217 something something something. And we can see that this is indeed the IP address we see here. Uh, and we see that there's a couple of messages going, uh, even later on. And this happens at around five seconds. And this might, the timing of this might make it seem like this is coming from application, because this was around the time we started it. But this is actually just a bit noise. If you go into another recording we made, we can see that this doesn't exist there. So this was actually just a bit of noise in the background. However, uh, between the calls to gstatic, there is actually another DNS call here. This one, let's mark it. And this goes to a company, uh, nuancemobility.net. And if you Google that name, Nuance, you will find out that it belongs to a voice recognition company. And that's a bit more interesting, isn't it? So uh, then there doesn't really happen anything till, till around about 20 seconds. We see this huge block of data. And we can see on the length of the messages that there's quite a lot of data in, in these messages. And this goes on for about 20 seconds. No, I'm sorry, 10 seconds. And it ends with a package coming back to our phone from Nuance. And then we see one, two, three, four messages. And unfortunately, we can't see the DNS request, but this is actually coming from Wikipedia. If you're Googling this IP address right here, you will find that it belongs to Wikipedia. Uh, so this is starting to make sense. Like we ask the other question, it goes to Nuance, it interprets that message. Oh. <laughs> and then um, it goes to Wikipedia and finds those answers, and the doll reads it back. Because at around this time frame, the doll actually read back the answers to us. Then it gets kind of quiet in the network until, not surprisingly, around 60 seconds, when we ask the doll about the weather. And again, we can see that this ends with a DNS request going to apiwonderground.com. And that is the um, uh, network address of the weather service, which was uh, uh, weather underground. And this ends with an HTTP request. It's actually not encrypted at all, so we can go in and look at it. Um, so we can show back the network. And we can see that it contains a JSON object. This is as not as nicely shown as in Fiddler, but we can still try to find some useful uh, information here. Like we can find that, oh, this is the weather forecast for Oslo, which might be interesting. So if you go back to the uh, messages that included the voice data, we can see that it's using SSL. It's encrypted. We can't actually see that data. That data. But of course, we had pretty strong indication that this is voice data because when it was being sent. But even though we can't see the data, we can at least try to figure out how much data is being sent. And we can do that as simply as pressing one of the packets sending data to Nuance. And we can apply as filter and add it to and selected. Now we're only seeing messages that is going from our phone and to Nuance, the speech recognition company. And we can hope it is, we can go into statistics, packet lengths, and we can apply our filter. Because Wireshark does not include any nice method of finding out how many packets, or I'm sorry, how much information is going from one IP to another. But we can use this statistics tool to help us. Because here we see that there's been 60 packets sent to Nuance, and the average size is about 470 bytes. Uh, this, of course, includes headers. So without the headers, it's more like 400 bytes. So doing a rough overview here, we see that this is about 60 times 400 uh, bytes. So this is about 23 or 24 kilobytes. So let's just go back to the presentation. 
Okay, let's see. So yeah, we saw that 23 kilobytes of data was transferred to Nuance, a company that specializes in speech recognition. And if they had used the MP3 file format, encoding usually at 120 kilobits, this would be about 1.5 seconds of recorded sound. And that is obviously not enough to contain the two questions we asked them. Uh, but MP3 is made for music, though. It's not made for the human voice. Uh, and the voice band of a human is about five times smaller than what is necessary for music. And furthermore, uh, the recorded sound is in mono, not stereo. And as it turns out, one does not need more than about 12 kilobits uh, to achieve a uh, tall quality voice level when transferring human voice. And for those of you who do not know, uh, tall quality voice is roughly the same as the sound quality you would get on an old analog phone. So using this new bitrate, we find that the file size actually contains about 15 seconds of recorded sound, which sounds a lot more reasonable. Uh, so just to summarize it all up, even though we are not able to directly observe that those 23 kilobytes uh, are voice data, we have very good indirect uh, evidence in terms of when we saw the data and the file size. Yeah, uh, we also wanted to check the communication between the doll and the mobile app. This communication is using Bluetooth, and the blo Bluetooth protocol is using something that is called frequency jumping. Uh, it's primarily used for, to avoid interfe interference with if there is several Bluetooth transmitters in the, in the same area. And it means that uh, in contrast for to, for instance, FM radio, which stays on the same frequency all the time, the frequency of the signal we are trying to monitor changes all the time. Basically, it changes between each packet. So you have to tune your radio after you have read one packet to the next frequency to wait for the next packet. And because of this frequency jumping, Bluetooth communication is actually a lot harder to monitor than Wi-Fi, and even more harder than the mobile network to see what is going on. Um, therefore, we used the opportunity to buy a lot of expensive hardware to be able to follow the frequency jumping. Uh, since these tools can be <laughs> very interesting for you, or you could even use them in some project, we will explain a bit about them. Uh, we'll start out with the simplest one. This is the Bluetooth Low Energy Sniffer. I think it's made, from, made of Nordic semiconductors. Uh, it is specially designed for monitoring Bluetooth Low Energy. And Bluetooth Low Energy has a bit less security than uh, Bluetooth Classic, and it also has a lot less uh, frequency jumping. That makes it a lot easier to monitor. What this device basically does is it starts out by listening to the announcement channels, and then it will see the devices uh, within reach. And once the connection is done, it uh, hooks, up to the, hooks onto that connection and starts to follow the frequency jumping. And it will be able to pipe the data coming in and directly into Wireshark. Uh, so this is perfect if you want to look at the data being transmitted for, from things like activity trackers or other IoT devices that is using Bluetooth Low Energy. And it's also very simple to get started, started using. Bluetooth Classic has a lot more encryption and it has a lot more complicated frequen frequency jumping. It has more channels, and the way it's jumping between, between the channels is a lot more complicated. Basically, you have to decrypt a packet, look at it, and see what channel the next one will be. And it d does this very fast. I, it does it 1,600 times a second. And what that means is that you will need custom hardware for doing the decryption and tuning the radio fast enough to catch the, ne the next packet. You could, of course, had uh, very many radios instead, but um, the best is to tune your radio. Uh, so eBluetooth is an open source hardware platform for doing this Bluetooth uh, classic uh, monitoring. It does come with lots of open source uh, software, and you can just download that from GitHub. 
but it is a lot more complicated than the Bluetooth Love Energy Sniffer. So you will probably have to spend a few very long nights until you get it working as you want. So to my personal favorite, Hack RF. That is a software-defined radio. That basically means that you can build your own radio receiver or transmitter in software. It has a huge frequency range from, I think it's 7 megahertz to 2 or 3 gigahertz. That means that you can monitor signals from garage door openers, airplanes, mobile phones, and even satellites. And the cool and a bit scary things, thing is that it also has the transmitter. So you can send the same signals back. So you can start opening garage uh, doors, or unlocking cars, or sending fake GPS signals. However, since HackRF is uh, export controlled, you should be prepared to answer a few questions from the US government when you buy it. Um, you will have to promise not to use it to make weapons and not to sell it to Iran or North Korea. However, <laughs> we were actually quite <laughs> disappointed. After buying all this equipment, we, re we realized that there were no need for fancy tools. Kayla did not have any auto authentication at all. You can actually use your mobile phone to take full control, listen to the conversations, and have her say whatever you want. And we'll try to do a quick demonstration here. <laughs> I think if I do this. <laughs> yeah. So that was just a quick demonstration of things you could do with Kayla. Oh, that was, we were just playing audio from our mobile phone to, to Kayla. And we can also do the same thing uh, to get the audio back from Kayla. It's like a, it's like a Bluetooth speaker, right? Exactly like exactly. a Bluetooth speaker. And they are really cheap, so they probably yeah. saved a lot of money by doing it like this. Yeah, or like I said in the introduction, it's basically a Bluetooth headset dressed up. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a Bluetooth headset without any security. Yeah. And you got... The next one? Yep. Um, of course, to be on the safe side, we did, of course, pick the DOS apart. Uh, we had already gotten quite a bit of attention at the office, going around with kids' toys, but it definitely <laughs> reached a new level when we tore them apart and took pictures of the remains out in the hallway. <laughs> so uh, when we opened them up, we found the name of the Bluetooth ship, and we went through some of the documentation when we found that the device enables something called secure simple pairing. And that, of course, sounds pretty nice. Uh, in their own words, though, it's useful whenever product implementers want to make the user experience easier and have accepted the increased risk of security attacks. And I'm not sure if the parents or grandparents who bought these toys for their child or grandparents really have accepted the increased risk of security attacks. So there are multiple ways this could have been avoided. Uh, the main advice here is to ensure that the user must have physical access to the device uh, during pairing. This can be as simple as there being a button which needs to be pressed during the pairing process. Or if you're a bit more serious, maybe a pin code that's shown on, shown on the device itself, ideally randomized between each time. But of course, uh, the best thing is a combina combination of the two. So, uh, in addition to IQ and Kyla, we also briefly took a look at a doll called Hello Barbie. Uh, while she does not utilize Bluetooth pairing, uh, she shows yet another way to improve security through simple hardware solutions. Uh, <laughs> don't worry though, she has her own set of security problems, so don't buy her either. But, um, well, she's a bit different from Kyla and IQ in that she's directly connected to the internet. She doesn't need a smartphone. Uh, otherwise, she's fairly similar in terms of functionality. To talk to Barbie, you have to press a button on her belt, which, is, which enables her microphone. And when we opened her up to try and figure out how all this worked, we found that what we suspected, that the microphone is connected to the button on her belt by hardware. Uh, this means that it is impossible to listen through that microphone unless that button is pressed, regardless of what kind of software access an attacker might be able to get. And this is really the best anyone can hope to achieve. So let's move on to the next subject, which is the application itself. Um, because much of what the dolls talk about cannot be found in the data streams in Fiddler or Wireshark. 
So we suspected that some of these messages were pre-recorded and that those were stored in the application itself. So we wanted to take a look. Uh, in other words, uh, it was time to do some decompiling. And especially when it comes to Android applications, this is surprisingly easy. A quick Google search gave us an online decompiler. And it was as easy as uploading the APK to the website and downloading the whole source code. And this is an example of what of the code we got back. It looks to be some leftover code or maybe a unit test. Uh, what I want to show you is that the decompiled code is very easy to read because the classes, methods, variable, assets, folders, and all, all, all the other names are their proper names as the developer wrote them. And this might be a surprise to you that the code can be both, both be retrieved so easily and read so easily. And I think uh, if you're write, writing code on the Android platform, especially on Java, you should be aware that your code is basically public and you should treat it as such. So this is a picture of the folder we got back from the online decompiler. I can just switch places. Thank you. Uh, and if you're an Android developer, I'm sure that some of these folders look familiar. Uh, but as we were looking for pre-recorded messages, we thought that the asset folder was a good place to start. And here we found a language folder, which looked promising. And inside here, there were a bunch of text files, including some stories, which Kyla can tell. And however, it was clear to us that there were more pre-recorded messages hiding somewhere, because we had heard many other pre-recorded messages, which we could not find in this text file. <laughs> so we went back to the asset folder, and we found this strange Kyla CD file. Uh, we quickly figured out that it was in SQLite database. And we, of course, decided to open it up, but it was encrypted. <coughs> but we were not set on giving up. Uh, so we decided to try to look some, through some of the code to see if we either could find some clues in how to open it, or at least figure out how it was being used. So <laughs> what we did was that we actually just searched for the name database. And then this, the first file that popped up was this database helper.java. Looks promising. Yeah, and in here we have some you know, some imports, a class, and of course, uh, the database password. <laughs> <laughs> and this was uh, extremely convenient. Uh, we are aware that we have just shown you how to find this password, but we have at least blacked out some of it, if some of you want to try it yourself at home. So, well, back to the database, open it up, enter the password. Cross your fingers. Yeah, and we were in. So, and the database contains about 16 tables. Uh, but the one that really caught our eyes uh, were the one that's called bad word. Uh, because, as it turns out, the database does not only contain pre-recorded messages what adults can say. Uh, but maybe more interestingly, it also contains what adults are not allowed to say. <laughs> so we, yeah, yeah we, ha we had uh, found out how they implement that kid-safe internet. Yeah, so they have this cool logo to go with it, which is kid-safe internet, which they put on their packets of these toys. Yes, yeah, so this is how they claim that these are kids safe internet. Yeah, so while this is kind of funny, uh, it wasn't really what we were looking for. Uh, so we went back and looked through the other tables, and we found thousands upon thousands of pre-recorded messages, uh, which was more than we had time to look through ourselves. So what we did was that we sent a copy of the database back to the consumer council, and we asked them for help if they could look through it. And they found some pretty good stuff, uh, because as it turns out, uh, Kyla really likes Disney. Like she says things like, I've seen The Little Mermaid maybe only 100 times. It's my number one Blue Ribbon favorite movie ever. And this is not the only example, uh, because Kyla really likes Disney. And she loves telling you about it. Uh, and not too surprisingly, it turns out that Genesis Toys, the creator of these dolls, have a marketing deal with Disney. Uh, now, Kyla is marketed as being your child's best friend. And for obvious reasons, it is not okay that your child's best friend are a hidden marketing tool for Disney. Yeah. We did, of course, write a n nice report documenting our findings. It has nice graphs and tables, pictures. And it is, of course, available on the internet for all to read. Unfortunately, the URL is this long. But it's easy to find. So if you Google toy fail, it will be among, among the top results. We don't really have enough time to go through all the findings. But the Consumer Console made 
this nice video explaining uh, some of the some of the um, the findings we did. So roll movie. There are some toys you really don't want in your home. This is Kayla and IQ. Unfortunately, these two internet connected toys are not as innocent as they look. There is not added any kind of security. With simple steps, I can talk through the doll and listen to other people. No one wants others to speak directly through the doll. All you said to eavesdrop to what is being said. That this can happen from a long distance makes it even scarier. And you may think that the conversation remains between the child and the doll. It does not. The conversation between the child and the doll is directly sent to a company in Burlington, Massachusetts, who can practically do whatever they want with the recording. And if that wasn't enough, when you use the toy, you also accept terms that allow the company to use the recording of the child for targeted advertising. It can share it with practically any third party they see fit, and they can change the terms at any time without notice to you. This is, in our view, a massive breach of many consumer laws. Kayla, can I trust you? I don't know. When we published the reports, the media attention was massive. Newspapers airs from all over the world wrote about it. We were in the Wall Street Journal, we were in Bo the Boston Globe, in uh, BBC, and of course, often Boston. Uh, and it was all over television. Toys, they claim, put children's privacy at risk. One of those toys is interactive doll, my friend Kayla. 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 Kayla doll spies. They're everywhere. NSA, CIA, and now MFC. My friend Kayla. With security gaps allowing it to be potentially hacked, turning it into a monitoring device. What the doll should say is, I'm recording everything your child says and transmitting it via smartphone back to my parent company. Private conversations between your child and the doll are recorded and then used without limitation. Poses a threat to your child's security. And parents that have bought this doll should destroy it. Be very quiet though. Really invasive surveillance. And that's just creepy. <laughs> that, that is absolutely the setup for a sci-fi movie about a dystopian future. How did we get there? My friend Kayla. The smart toy banned in Germany. Germany has banned the doll. Kayla. The media impact was pretty massive, and when the dust started, started to settle, we counted 1,720 articles or things on television about it, and we had 152 million 900,000 potential readers or viewers about the stories about Kayla. The toys were withdrawn from several markets. Big toy chains in the United States, Belgium, and the Netherlands stopped uh, selling their toys. And in Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, BR Toys and Toys R Us offered the money back if you handed in the toys, also if you didn't have a receipt for them. <coughs> in Germany, the toys got banned, and the pa parents were told to destroy the microphone in the illegal, illegal dolls. And the latest development is that Kayla has ended up in the Spy mu Museum in Berlin, alongside the Eli Enigma. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this is a good uh, time for questions. Yep. Anyone? Did the company contact you? No, we didn't hear anything from them. They have been like crawling under a rock or something, and <laughs> either not, neither we have heard from them or the consumer console. Yeah. Yeah, the, con e the consumer council tried to contact them, and they set out this kind of uh, what's called like a basic message, standard message. But it didn't. Yeah, they didn't really comment. Yeah, on I it. think a few of the newspapers also tried to contact them without any response. So they are like being very quiet. So, so who tried to make the audit, uh, without any regulations or 
Not in Germany. In Germany, it's illegal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, for, no, for now, it has not been any regulations concerning stuff like this, or at least few regulations, but that is about to change. Yeah. Exactly. Well, yeah, that's what we're hoping to change. I don't know. Probably, at least some parts of it. Uh, and there are regulations for some of these things. For instance, many countries has uh, regulations against uh, marketing against children. So these dolls are probably already breaking regulations in Norway concerning advertisement uh, directed at children. Oh. Yeah. So what can we learn from all of this? To skip on security to save time and money? can be a very risky gamble that can or will blow up spectacularly when you get caught. So don't let your next product become the next Kayla. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you.